Hey boys and girls, it's me and I'm back in the lair. And uh just want to start by saying thank you for the kind comments on the uh on the Cuss Town video and uh, my other videos uh, that I've been putting up lately, the car shows. Um, right now I want to talk to you a little bit about the new camera. I'm actually uh, I'm actually on the new camera right now and the camera is a Panasonic, that program just ran through here. <laughs> new camera is a Panasonic, it's called Lumix. Now someone that I know had one of these and uh, seemed very happy. Uh, I read some reviews on it and uh, they were quite good. So uh, after doing a lot of research and trying to save some money up for a few months, this camera was not uh, not cheap. It was a couple hundred bucks, but uh, you can see the difference uh, compared to the Sony. Now the Sony, which I have right here, let me go grab it for you. This has been a tried and true staple. This is a, a cyber shot. I forget the model number on this. It's up here somewhere. It's a DSCW290. Um, I've had been using this since 2010. And I like this camera so much I got Mrs. RW one as well. And uh, she uses it for various things. But it has its limitations and it's not uh, not quite as good as the Panasonic. So, uh, well, let me change cameras. You'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, and now you're watching me through the cyber shot, and uh, I guess for here you could you could actually see a little bit of a difference. Uh, and it's probably not quite as clear, and you know it, it, it's still a decent camera, but it's just not uh, not as good as the uh, the Lumix. So, um, and I w I thought about getting another Sony camera, get a better better Sony camera, but uh, you know it, it seems like I was good. I, I could find something that was probably comparable to the to the Lumix, but the the thing is, is that the the Lumix was just just maybe half the price of what Sony had to offer. It's not it's not a a dig to Sony or anything like that. I've been buying Sony stuff from for for many many years, and uh, it's just that the the Panasonic was just a better buy. Okay, so some of you are asking why did why did I choose now is the time to pull the trigger for for a new camera? Well, it's actually been quite a while. I, it's probably been over a year since I plan on doing this. The, the thing is that in 2019 I've had a few financial hardships that uh, kind of got in the way and it prevented me from doing it right away. With the big one being the accident, and I was probably within a week or two away of buying a new camera, and then the accident happened. So that. And I was back in May, and then uh, I also had my water heater go in the house. And that was uh, that went into four figures. And uh, you know, if you're a homeowner, you know exactly where I'm coming from. You know, these things are not uh, not cheap items to be uh, to be dealt with. But I did receive some feedback from you, my my, my viewers, and I, I take everything seriously as far as what you what you tell me and uh, what you like and what you don't like. I, I always have. Um, matter of fact, in, in February, we'll be going on 10 years of this YouTube channel. So in February 2020, it'll be, you know, it'll be 10 years. It's been, been quite a while. I made quite a few videos. Um, but uh, j just to put it into some perspective, uh, when I was uh, just kind of getting started out, and I, I had a, a mentor, let's just say a business mentor, his name was Charlie, and uh, uh, not too many people that I worked with like Charlie. As a matter of fact, a lot of them didn't. They they hated Charlie because he was just kind of a, you know, upfront on it. You know, he he basically always you always knew where you stood with Charlie, and that's why I respected him. And uh, you know, his, one of his lines was, uh, "We could always get by, or we could always get better." And uh, I've always taken that into consideration with everything I do, you know, in life. So, uh, so that being said. Um, anyway, now we're back to the, the Lumix camera, and I uh, hope I hope you like the uh, the new look. Um, I know I do, and I hope you do too. So let me show you a couple things. I want to change things up a little bit today, but we're going back to a radio related thing, and that is uh, I just did some radio restorations for uh, a gentleman not too long ago, and uh, he kind of was 
he didn't have a lot of money, but his father was a radio guy. He did it for, for a while. And uh, when he passed uh, several years ago, he held on to a bunch of things from him, some, some books, some tubes, and uh, specifically a couple radios that he wanted me to fix for him just so he can remember his dad. And uh, I did that for him, and then as part of the payment for the radio repair, he, he gave me some stuff. So I want to show you a couple of these cool books that he gave me, and I think you'll uh, you'll enjoy it because they're they're real old school. All right, the first book I have here on my bench is, uh, so you can see here in the title, it says here, Sprayberry Voltage Tables, Voltage Tables for Broadcast Receivers. And there's a date here on the bottom. Let's, let me get, it, get a better light here so you can see. Copyright 1935. And this is actually a neat book. What this book can do, as far as if you're a radio repair person is, I made a few marks in here, um, but what, what this the voltage tables do is they show you basically a lot of different radios of that era, and what the voltages, measured voltages at certain points at certain tubes should be. Now I've got a couple marks in here. Let me open this up where I got marked. And I get this little mark out of the way here. And I think most of you are familiar if you're if you're radio people with the Philco 70. And that's what I have right here. And you can see here, um, let me get a get a pointer. So you can see that now the Philco 70 has seven tubes. And you can see the tube line up here at 35, 24, 35, 27, 35, 47, and 80. Okay, uh, this also could be 51, 35 and 51 is the same tube. So it shows here the tube type, the tube function, whether it's uh, the case of the first 35, it's an RF tube. Uh, this is, the next one is 24 and it has one DO, which is I think first detector and oscillator. Uh, next one is another, it's the IF tube. Uh, the 27 is a second detector, 35, one AF audio frequency, two audio, second audio frequency, and then 80 is R, I guess that's the rectifier. It shows here the heater voltages for each tube, uh, plate voltages, uh, screen grid voltages, see, and so on and so on. It's for a number of radios here. Now this particular section of the book, you can see I've got for all Philco radios. But this was kind of a, a, kind of a guide for uh, the service man, ladies, don't get mad by me saying that, but that's what that's what they were called back in the day. They were servicemen, was service to radios, and this would give you an idea, or this would help to troubleshoot if you had a uh, a problem in a certain area with the with the radio. Now, while I was going through this book, I get to the back of the book. You can see I got it marked here with the one of my wooden skewer backslash pointers, right up here. It says, one out of every four servicemen will fail this year. And uh, according to this, if you read the whole thing through, uh, you could you could pause the video and read it word for word, but uh, it's basically kind of like a scare tactic. You know, it's like when you get the uh, things in the mail from your uh, from your, your your water company or whatever, it says uh, if your, your water line breaks, you know, you're responsible for it and it's going to cost you a lot of money, but we can insure it for you and that kind of nonsense. This is kind of a scare tactic. So if you don't get get on board and you get the uh, Sprayberry uh, lesson guides on how to do radios, you know, you may fail like uh, these four uh, guys up here, or one out of those four anyway will fail. So I thought that was kind of funny. Okay, the second book I have here is uh, Dale Radio Parts, or just Dale Parts Incorporated. And uh, these were for radio stuff. It shows here radio replacement parts and radio sets, tube supplies, and all kinds of stuff. And here's the address, Dale Parts Incorporated, 29 Murray Street in New York. Now, if some of you are wondering if this was uh, located on the old radio row, uh, the answer is it's not. All right, I have up here on Google Maps, I have it pinned right here where it says 29 Murray Street right here. Well, that's where Dale Parts would have been. Of course, obviously, it's not there now. But Radio Row 
like here is World World the World Trade Center right here, and then you see right here it says, I don't know how well you can read that, it says WTC or World Trade Center, Cortland Street. And right in this area, this whole area in here, was where Radio Row was back in the day. So it wasn't really a part of Radio Row, it was actually about the about four or so blocks away. Okay, so as I open it up, here is uh some initial advertising. I haven't looked in here in a while. I just open up to a arbitrary page. Here's uh, some capacitor sales. That's for Aerovox car radio uh, caps right there. Buy from Dale. There's some more uh, capacitors for sale. Let me flip over to some other stuff here. Oh, here's some resistors. And buy a resistor cabinet right here. Oh, there's some big old dog bone, adjustable dog bone uh, resistors that you can buy. Gotta remember that back in that time, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, people didn't buy radios. Look at all these batteries. This is, I guess, if you had a farm set or if you had a, uh, like maybe an old Atwater Kent uh, 20 or something like that that needed batteries and get new batteries there. There's some plugs and jacks and other stuff. So it's just a whole bunch of neat stuff back in the day. This is all 1935. Look at this. Replacement field coils. So if you had a field coil speaker, you can get replacement field coils and probably speakers as well. This is probably the whole thing. Field coil speakers. Some more. Oh, look at this. Thordson 6 watt high gain amplifier. A big mono block there. 6 watt amplifier. Now, don't, don't laugh about that 6 watts. 6 watts and 2 Wario is not a slouch. They have a price on it. So you have to buy. All the individual pieces I guess together so if you buy all the pieces uh -huh. trying to find the price I guess it says 450 right there so pretty neat stuff let me just see what else is back in here uh, I can just get it opened what is this? Oh, a signal generator. All wave continuously variable. 60 KC to 30 megacycles. Wow. I guess in 1935, 30 megs was considered UHF, right? Think about it. Oh, and here's the Sylvania, Sylvania tube stuff. This is like a big poster I'd have to open up. New glass tubes. I like that. 6B5, that's a weird uh, tube. They only made that for a few years. Six E6. There's a six A3. That's a two A3 with a six volt filament. So oh, I guess they're a big uh, Sylvania tube dealer. So there you go. Okay, well, I hope you uh, enjoyed those books. Those are pretty cool. Uh, go back in the day and uh, see uh, see that kind of stuff. Hey, listen, it's uh, it's October and it's starting to get cold outside, but don't fret. Um, we still have a swap meet that's coming next month. Let me show you here. Let me give you the information. I got my shop laptop here. New Jersey Antique Radio Club Fall Sweep Swap Meet Ham Fest. Coming up on Saturday, November the second. So that's basically about three weeks away. Okay, so I'll be there. Just look for look for me and stop by, say hello. It's five dollar club donation to get in. 
Um, and there's something there for everybody. I mean, if you're looking for a project to work on or you need some tubes or some parts or something that's already done, um, it's a good little fest. I enjoy it and uh, hope to see you there. So anyway, thanks for watching and uh, take care. Bye.